<coughs> good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, let me start by congratulating kapil mohan for this and government of karnataka for this nice conference kapil is a batchmate and a good friend and it's a good idea that we all should learn from each other meet at least once a year if not more frequently uh that takes me to the next point every conference has a take away i also propose that as a take away from this conference if no other state is coming forward we would like to host the next second national conference in bihar <laughs> please don't get scared of coming to bihar we can do a very good job of it it's a nice state i can feel some of the people are not uh, uh, it's 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 a good place to come so uh, jadav sir it was your initiative which was an idea developed by kapil i wish to carry forward and i would not take much time uh, i would just give you a brief about what we are we are a board of revenue in the original british sense we have carried on that legacy and for the past two days i was thinking whether we can emulate the karnataka model or not so uh, there are problems in emulate we emulating karnataka model because we look after all the cases just like karnataka appellate tribunal does except that we have a specialized uh, tribunal for commercial taxes and we have a specialized tribunal for the land uh, revenue cases also we are a revisional forum essentially what happens is our original order is passed by a collector or a deputy collector then it goes to the appellate forum which could be divisional commissioner and then at a revisional level it comes to the board of revenue we were constituted under a board of revenue bihar and bengal board of revenue act 1879 so we are that old and uh, to emulate karnataka model we have to think of changing or deleting uh, amending the act or maybe doing away with the entire act we also do a lot of other works which in your state is being looked after by karnataka public service commission we look after a lot of administrative work departmental examinations departmental promotions the chairman who is my senior is the chief secretary rank officer and he is generally looking after all those administrative things i on my part when i joined the uh, board of revenue in november i was given all the land sealing cases there were 147 land sealing cases given to me in november i have no hesitation in confessing that i have disposed of all of them and there is no pendency in my court and the last order was passed in this month only so all 147 cases and i was very happy to note that justice reddy also just reconfirmed my view that no cases should be dismissed for default wherever the courts wherever the lawyers they're not appearing the parties are not appearing you still go ahead and pass an order on merit the earliest case pending in the board of revenue was 1978 which had disposed of in 2017 and the newest case was of 2016 much of it as uh, it exist lies with the lawyers lies with the advocates and particularly revenue is a very very specialized area unless you have done the work in the field you have seen the field it is not possible for any appellate member or a, or a tribunal member to appreciate what the original court has said what the revisional uh, uh, the the appellate uh, court has said so i did i i uh, dispose of all the 147 cases and when i sent my report to the chief secretary i nearly got a panic call from him he said what kya pathak you dispose of all 147 cases in one order only i said no sir it was a 1200 pages judgment running into uh, it was not a single order i passed 147 orders running into uh, roughly about 1200 pages of judgment last 3 or 4 months i have been hearing the court every day morning court evening dictation morning court evening dictation not from the dictation i yesterday i could recall a speaker who noted that a, who observed that one judge said stenographer absent bail denied stenography 
as one speaker yesterday mentioned, is a dying art. And it's a fact. The stenographer thinks that he can do steno in English or Hindi. Uh, in your case, it was English or Kannada. But when he brings the thing, he, 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 he will come back and uh, you will not know what has, uh, what you dictated and what he has come back with. So I said, uh, I got a computer operator. I said, I don't need stenographers. Uh, a two screen, uh, uh, a computer with two screens. He was sitting on the system. I was having the screen with me. As I start doing the dictation, that way I saved five hours. First you give two hours to steno for dictation. Then he takes three hours to develop it into English. Then you take another one hour to correct it. So instead of five hours, I used to dispose of a judgment in two hours sharp. So uh, that is how revisional forum should work. I mean, we are not supposed to open a plethora of the procedures that is taken, that has evolved in the district court or say high court. Were we to follow the same model, where was the need for us to carry on with the tribunal or a board of revenue? We should dispose of our cases in a, in a very time bound fashion. Why should we have a lower court record? Why should we call a lower court record? You ask the lawyer, please convince me. Why do you want me to call for a lower court record? It will take two years, three years. Fortunately, in my case, since the cases were pending since 1978, all the LCRs were already received. Very few which were still not received, I used to ring up in the morning and tell the collector that please send the records. But then why should we have those records? You, you, all you need at the revisional forum, all you need at the board of revenue or at a tribunal level, all you need to see is the original court order, the appellate court order. Where is the infirmity? Learn it, friend, please point out. So uh, this is how, in my view, a revisional forum should function. Of course, there is a, beyond us, there is a high court. In Bihar, as I mentioned, we have a land reform tribunal headed by a retired high court judge. There is a member administration, member judicial. So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, one important point that we uh, forgot to mention that we have amended our act also, that all appeals should be disposed of within six months. All revisional cases by the Board of Revenue should be disposed of within three months. So that's a part of the amendment because you can't have a Board of Revenue which has cases since 1978. Or in Karnataka, I was, mentioned, I was told that in 1948 there was a case of 1948. You can't have that kind of a pendency at our level, at this tribunal level. And much of it lies with the advocates. They take time in arguing. I was reminded that in the ceiling, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the ceiling cases, they argue for one hour, two hours. I would keep reminding them that please point out the merits. And I was, I was reminded of a joke when a lawyer was arguing the case since morning. It went till post lunch session. The judge was now running uh, short of patience. He was looking at the wall. He was losing his concentration. So the lawyer said, me lord, don't look at the wall. I still have many more law points. So judge was now, he got fed up. He said, my dear learned friend, what made you think that I'm looking at the wall, clock? I'm not looking at the clock. I'm looking at the calendar. Please finish the arguments today. I'll be happy. Don't take it to the next day. So you, if the lawyers are, you at, at the revenue board, I keep telling them, just give me the points of merits. Where do you want me to intervene? Justify it. And that's how the things came up. So uh, I would say that uh, at our level, we should not, we should amend the act also. I don't know whether Kannad Kaiblet Tribunal has a time limit for disposal of cases, but we should have those time limits. Like Bihar has done, we have amended the act. All revisional cases before the Board of Revenue should be disposed of in three months sharp. So that uh, we, 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 should, we should not take away, uh, take the entire judicial process into tribunals. Otherwise, what's the point of having tribunals? So that's all. I would like to finish my uh, thing with again an invitation, uh, renewing my invitation that next year we should meet in Patna. Thankfully, good. Thank you, Mr. Pathak. I think uh, 
uh, KAT probably wishes to thank you also for extending that uh, invitation, that offer for the next year's conference. And uh, Mr. Patak has added a very important point as to whether the law should specify time limit, and that can probably uh, be one of the concerns for uh, the policymakers who are thinking about changing the procedure of tribunals. Uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, call upon the next. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Ronak Jaiswar from OP, OP General Global University. Firstly, I would like to thank the Karnataka Appellate Tribunal for organizing this impressive conference and for inviting me to be a member of the esteemed panel. The tribunals, which are constituted as a specialized body to adjudicate on special matters, which require a high level of technical expertise. Proponents of the tribunal system have argued that the tribunal system is necessary to overcome the pendency problem by having expert judges. However, there is an inconsistency with the Karnataka Appellate Tribunal Act 1976 with respect to Section 3, which says that the chairman shall be an officer, not below the rank of divisional commissioner. It is pertinent to note here that the constitutionality of a tribunal like Intellectual Property Appellate Board and the Competition Commission of India have been challenged in the courts. In the matter of IPAB, the head of the tribunal was an executive appointee, which the Madras High Court held to be perverse. The chairman is, in effect, an executive appointee. Judicial independence is a vital condition that ensures that judiciary deliver justice without being prejudiced by an, any outside consideration. And this ideal is essential to the preservation of the rule of law. By allowing for appointments to be made by a majority of executive members, these bodies cannot function as an independent bodies insulated from any political influence. Critics such as Mr. M. C. Chagla pointed out that appeals from tribunals to high court could be denied by legislation, forcing a man wronged by a tribunal to go all the way to the Supreme Court in Delhi to seek relief. In United Kingdom, the court referring to its earlier decision in Friendly versus United Kingdom 1997 restated the requirements of independence and impartiality. On independence, the court declared that in establishing whether the court or tribunal was independent, regard had to be made entirely to the matter, manner of appointment of its members and the term of office, the existence of guarantees against outside pressures, and the question whether the body present an appearance of independence. On impartiality, the court restated the proposition that the tribunal must first be subjectively free of personal prejudice or bias. Second, it must also be impartial from an objective viewpoint. That is, it must offer sufficient guarantees to exclude any legitimate doubt in respect. With this um, judicial pronouncement in mind, I would like to posit that the administrative function of the tribunals be hived off from judicial functions, which in respect is to create a separate separate body that manages only the administrative functions and the judiciary is completely different from the administrative part. In effect, everything that is concerned with passing orders or decrees is into judicial compartment and anything outside should be managed by the administrative department. Thank you, Ronak. Most things, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as with most things in life, um, everything has a plus and a minus. As the last speaker, I have the privilege of having the last word in this discussion. But also as the last speaker before lunch, I know nobody wants to listen to me for more than five minutes. So I will not repeat uh, anything that has been said by far more eminent uh, speakers than me. Uh, let me just briefly give you um, an idea of what we did at Vidhi and uh, one major takeaway 
that I think we should all keep in mind when we're talking about uh, policy and tribunals. At um, Vidhi, we had the opportunity to study two very major tribunals set up by the central government, the TDSAT and the IPAB. We had a chance to work with the central government on the issue of merging uh, tribunals. We also studied the impact of the Supreme Court's judgments on all tribunals, specifically the NTT judgment, uh, which had a major impact, I think, on a whole set of tribunals. I don't want to go into the specifics of uh, each study or uh, what specific findings we made, uh, but I want, to, I want to focus on one important aspect, and that is this. Everything that we discussed today in terms of policy and who has to make what changes to the functioning of the tribunals um, depends very much on who actually makes the changes. When I say this, I mean that the control, the supervision, and the management of tribunals is currently a mess in this country. Um, our st study showed that uh, tribunals have become orphans. Uh, they are neither part of the judiciary, they're neither considered part of the formal judiciary, uh, nor are they considered the core concern of the parent ministry which is in charge of them, and uh, it's, they're nobody's problem. I think uh, that is a very sad state of affairs. Uh, I personally don't know the exact situation in Karnataka. We haven't done that study yet, but um, from what I was able to make out, this, is the, this was true of a large number of tribunals across the country. I think if we have to start talking about what changes need to be made to tribunals, the conversation has to first start by saying that tribunals are not an alternate to courts. They are as much part of the court system as your uh, the High Court, Supreme Court, and the District Judiciary. They should therefore be treated as part of the judiciary and constitutionally should enjoy the same protections and the independence of the judiciary. Uh, Justice, Ram, uh, Justice Ramon, uh, Ramon Reddy made a very important point about having a central institution. I think the judiciary as a whole has uh, also functions as an institution for the issues of the judiciary. You have conferences of chief ministers and chief justices where the chief justice and the chief uh, can, and the Supreme Court judges can put forth their points. You have the collegium which deals on an equal basis with the central government on issues of appointment. And you have various committees set up by the Supreme Court which are also concerned with the issues of the judiciary. Unfortunately, there is no such body for tribunals. We can't create a body for the tribunals out of thin air. And I don't think the government will be taking up these issues because they're just not on the list of priorities. I think the most important fundamental reform that uh, tribunals in this country need is to be considered part of the judiciary and enjoy the same level of protection and changes and uh, protection and benefits of such uh, uh, reform. Uh, coming back to a point as to why do we really need to do this? I think uh, we have come to a situation where there is a crisis in the Indian judicial system. I know everybody keeps saying there's always a state of crisis, but I think this is something that um, has come about, has come to light recently. Specifically, I want to point to two very interesting studies, one carried out by Daksh and uh, one carried out by the Cornell University, which actually show that contrary to popular belief, there is no litigation explosion in India. Um, recently, the chief economic advisor said there's a litigation explosion in India. Unfortunately, that is absolutely untrue. What we instead have is large-scale judicial exclusion litigation exclusion. We have people being unable to access judicial institutions for various reasons. And even when they have an opportunity to access, they are not choosing to come to the judicial institutions. These are issues which I'm sure more people are doing research. I just wanted to highlight this here to say that this is a problem we'll have to start dealing with now. The theme of this conference is access to justice. The point of this conference is to find out how we can increase access to justice. And I think the starting point of further inquiry should be that, yes, there is a huge problem in accessing justice. And any reforms that we consider, whether in tribunals, whether in courts, and in any other judicial institution, has to start from the point of view of how do we make them more accessible to people. So with that, I'd like to conclude my remarks. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak.